Happy New Year to everyone and welcome to Balkans Debrief. My guest today is Tim Judah, a journalist for The Economist, a long-time observer and the author of several books on the region. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. And before we start, congratulations on an excellent piece over at Unheard, which you published last week about the Serbia and Kosovo conflict. We will include the link to the piece in our show notes. In the article, you note that the end of year flare up between, uh, in the north of Kosovo bordering Serbia was the latest of a cycle of crisis that repeats itself every time there is a deadline being made or a new agreement is about to take effect. What was your personal read of the mood between the two countries uh, from your meetings and uh, from your visit there? You, you met with the Serbian and Kosovo intellectuals. Is there a way out, Tim? Um, well, I mean, there's always a way out. There's all, I mean, it's really quite easy to see all sorts of solutions uh, which could be Uh, which could be made. It's not, it's, that's not the problem. The problem is, is there political will? And, and the fact is that I don't think that at the moment there is a political will to find a, a way out. But I don't think it's very difficult to find a way out. I mean, you know, it didn't take, it took whatever it was, 27 years to find a resolution of the conflict between uh, uh, Greece and, uh, and now North Macedonia. I mean, they probably could have sorted that out in a week if there had been political will, but there wasn't political will for 27 years or something, and it wasn't the circumstances were not right. Uh, but once there was political will, it was easy to sort out. Or easy, I, mean, I don't want to exaggerate, but it was possible to sort it out. What was your read of the political will between the parties? Um, well, I just want to make this clear that I, I only went to Kosovo this time. I didn't go to Serbia itself, but I mean, I did spend time in in the north, in the Serbian-dominated north. And but, you know, my feeling, my gut feeling, is that there isn't really much political will. I think that uh, the, the, the the leaders are, I wouldn't say kind of happy to continue the way they are, but I mean, they're not they're not they're not that unhappy. I mean, if they were that unhappy, then they would sort it out, but they're not, and so they don't. So you know, we've had what, since June, six or seven of these crises or, or, already. And that's just since the last June. You know, I'm not even talking, you know, about the number of crises in the last 10 years. But, you know, my point was that in, in that article was that what's often missed by journalists in Western countries who don't follow the region very closely is that they don't, they don't realize that there's a kind of very set now kind of traditional pattern now you know it, first of all there's some sort of disagreement then either pristina sets a deadline or uh, there's in the north and uh, barricades go up uh, then there's harsh words spoken uh, You know, then the diplomats go into um, overdrive. Then the Serbian army puts on social media that it's deploying along the along the border. And then people who don't know say the Balkans are on the brink of war again, which is you know generally nonsense. Always, always nonsense. In fact, because they forget that uh, you know NATO has thousands of troops in Kosovo to defend it. So, you know, uh, and then eventually some sort of deal is uh, you know is found. But the problem is that with these constant flare-ups, it's impossible for the diplomats to get down to the real business, which is finding a sort of long-term uh, solution for the normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo. What do you think about how the president of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, handled the most recent? I mean, you know, it was kind of like 50-50, wasn't it? I mean, he they gained, in general terms... They gained the release of the policeman, uh, Dan Pantic, who had been arrested by the uh, Kosovo police on charges of terrorism. And he was put in under house arrest, which was basically what they had wanted him from to be released from prison. Um, but I don't think that they, they, they gained very much more. So, but I mean, that was what they said that the barricades had gone up about. It was about this issue of... Um, Uh, of Dan Pantic, the, the, the policeman. But I mean, it doesn't solve the, the previous problems, which are now that the Serbs have left the institutions, etc. And of course, you know, violent incidents continue. You know, what they built the barricades about was already the, the, the previous crisis. The next crisis, or maybe it won't blow up, but the next potential crisis is related to the fact that two young Serbs in Stodipsa were, were shot and injured um, over Orthodox uh, Christmas. I mean, it, it may or may not be that that blows into a full-time full -time crisis, full-term crisis, but I mean, you know, it's, it's possible that, you know, these things come all the time. The potential for crises come all the time because there isn't you know, a kind of full-time full -time normalization between Serbia, between Kosovo, um, between Serbs 
and Albanians in Kosovo as well. Uh, and uh, Tim, how about the position of Albin Kurti? Is he being strategic about his stance in asking for rep- reciprocity in the license plate dispute? Does he have a plan for how to negotiate with the West? Or is he convinced that holding a hard line gives him the best results? I mean, you know, the, the the problem is he's being forced to negotiate in something that he doesn't believe in. I mean, he made, you know, his career in opposition saying that he didn't believe in, in dialogue with Serbia and he didn't want dialogue with Serbia, or at least this dialogue with Serbia. And, uh, you know, part of the key issue is that ultimately the, the problem is, you know, in exchange for de facto recognition, Kosovo is supposed to give some form of association or community of uh, Serbian municipalities, which he doesn't believe in and, and doesn't want. So, you know, he's being sort of pushed and encouraged to to do something he doesn't want to do. And, you know, he's uh, um, quite ideological in that sense. I mean, he's, he's a sort of conv- much more of a, he's perhaps more of a conviction politician than, than we've been used to in uh, recent years in, in the Balkans. Perhaps he's much less sort of flexible and, 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 and pragmatic than, than others have been. Um, but And how can that play for Kosovo? I mean, again, it's like kind of 50-50 because I think that on the, on the one hand, it does erode long-term support because he's seen as inflexible. He's seen as a politician. But I'm talking about the, the, the few diplomats to deal with Kosovo. I'm not talking about in general. I mean, we're, we're not talking about, I mean, obviously most people in the West have never heard of Albin Kurti and most politicians in the West have never heard of Albin Kurti. I'm just talking about the, the diplomats and the people who do have to deal with it. You know, I think that they they find that frustrating. On the other hand, you know, for Albin Kurti, it has been delivering results. You know, the reciprocity p- policy has, you know, has worked to a certain extent. And that makes it, which is obviously enraging for um, for Alexander Vucic, you know, but, you know, whether it's going to lead to, um, so, you know, reconciliation and, and, and some form of normalization, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look like it, does it? Yeah. So, as you said, though, even though this uh, association of Serb uh, municipalities, the famous ASM, uh, was agreed upon by previous Kosovo leaders, Kurti has pledged not to allow a Zajednica, as he called it in Kosovo. Uh, the West, though, appears to be pressuring him to implement it. And you said he is being, yeah. Will he bend? Something. We don't, we don't really know what, but then they're supposed to, that's exactly what the negotiations are for, to, to discuss this. Exactly. It doesn't necessarily have to be association of Serbian municipalities exactly how perhaps it was envisaged to begin with, but something anyway that they can agree on. Some sort of guarantees for the rights of the Serbs living in north of uh, Kosovo. Well, it's it, it's guarantees, but I mean, specifically when it was agreed, I mean, it was, you know, it was clear, it was things like education, it was things like, uh, you know, healthcare, you know, in other words, so that Serbs could use, you know, could be helped by the Serbian Ministry of Education, that they could use hospitals and medical facilities from, from, from Serbia, and also to define exactly what Serbia's role would be in those areas, because now it's, it's not defined, is it? Mm-hmm. So it, it would be a kind of two-way thing, you know, what would, it would be defined what they could do and also what Serbia could do and what, and, and what Kosovo's role uh, would be. But, you know, you know, I understand it's something that, uh, you know, is, is unpalatable for any government of Kosovo, but it's also unpalatable for any government of Serbia that Kosovo should be independent. But the whole point of negotiations is that, uh, is that no one is going to be happy at the end of it. I mean, if somebody, if one side was happy or the other side was not happy, that would be victory and defeat. And that's not the aim of this. The aim is to find some sort of workable solution, um, you know, which will mean that uh, people can live a normal life. And, and frankly, the, the fact is that, you know, people in the north of Kosovo, Serbs in the north of Kosovo, you know, mm-hmm. they don't want to be part of the Kosovo, the state of Kosovo, you know, but what they do want, above all, is some form of normal life. And they haven't led any form of normal life for a quarter of a century now, since, you know, since the war began in Kosovo. So, you know, if there was some sort of agreement which basically let them live a normal life, well, they would accept it. I mean, they wouldn't have had much, much choice, but they would, they would accept it. But do they see their future in Kosovo, though, the Serbs in the north? Um, well, if you ask them, do you want to live in Kosovo, they would say no. If you ask them, like, what is the, 
what is realistic, they would, mm-hmm. you know, many people were, well, I mean, there are a lot of people, I think there are quite a lot of people who still hope for and believe in partition, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not a social scientist. I haven't done opinion polls, but, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people who still believe in partition and hope for partition and hope that the border will be on the bridge, as they say, on the border, on the bridge of the river, on the river Ebar. Um, but, you know, realistically, I think, uh, you know, probably quite a few people would be resigned to the fact that they would be living in yeah. a Kosovo state. I but, think that card is off the table. Uh, well, you say it's off the table, but it's, it's off the table for the moment because, you know, that it, partition is an issue that never goes away. It's like the tide, you know, it comes and goes and comes and goes. So for, for you know, for decades, it's sort of come and gone. And, you know, uh, you, yeah, it's off the table today, but, you know, in, in in one year, three years, five years, it might might come back. You don't know, but my punch is it'll probably come back at one stage. I see. At this time, though, that the dialogue uh, between uh, Belgrade and Pristina is in such a bad shape, uh, with uh, trust at historic lows, the French and the Germans have put forward a proposal for normalization, and they will start meeting uh, in January and to, to have these meetings and find out if this will be agreed on. Does it stand a chance of being adopted, in your view? No, it, it, it stands a chance. I mean, it's, it, it's it, if there's political will at the moment, I don't really see that there is political will to do it. I mean, it's it, it's it, is it that new from things that have been proposed in the past? You know, I, I'm not sure. I think that we've known more or less that the sort of parameters of a deal between Serbia and Kosovo at some stage would be some form of de facto recognition and this uh, some form of autonomy or some form of association or community of Serbian municipalities. So I think we've kind of known that. I don't think it's kind of radically new from, from what's been discussed in the past. I, you know, I, if I had to bet, you know, mm-hmm. if I had to bet, would there be an agreement next year? I would bet that there, there wouldn't be. But, you know, I wouldn't bet a lot of money that there won't be either. But my gut feeling is that there won't be. You know, my gut feeling is that these two leaders in particular actually, uh, you know, there, there isn't a political will to do the deal. I mean, I, uh, that, that, that's, that's my feeling. And, and, and one of the things I said in that article, uh, and which I felt for some, some time now, is that there is an added problem here, which is I think that there is, uh, you know, on top of all the political problems that already exist, is that this personal antipathy. And I think the fact is that Alban Kurti and, and Alexander Vucic personally absolutely loathe each other. You know, if there was some sort of a personal rapport, it would just kind of make things kind of, you know, it would just kind of make things a bit easier. And one of the things I mentioned in that article was that in the last interview I'd done with Hashim Thachi a few years ago, yeah. uh, the former president of, of Kosovo, at the, at the end of the interview, I, you know, I got up and he said, oh, are you seeing Alexander? And I went, who? I didn't know what he was talking about. And then I realized he was talking about Alexander Vucic. But what it's, what I, what it Told me what you sensed was a personal connection there. Yeah. They had a kind of, they didn't, they didn't, they, they came from 180 degrees different uh, political perspective, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, but they didn't personally kind of loathe each other. They didn't personally hate each other. Um, and, and, and don't forget that, at, you know, at the time when, when, um, when Alexander Vucic was, um, uh, a minister in um, uh, Slobodan Milosevic's government in 1999. You know, uh, Hashim Thaci was one of the leading lights of the Kosovo Liberation Army. And and at that stage, Albin Kuti wasn't, you know, he was in prison in, in Serbia, political prisoner in, in Serbia. So you can imagine that, that is quite enough to engender a sort of long-lasting um, bitterness. But, you know, other people have been in prison before. You know, Nelson Mandela was in prison for a lot longer than uh, Albin Kuti was in prison. But, you know, he came out of prison a, di- a different man. So... You know, I, I'm not. I'm not going to generalize here, but I'm just sort of looking back on the past. Back to the German-French uh, paper. Do you think the EU has any kind of leverage? Can they, for instance, guarantee uh, the five non-recognizers to recognize Kosovo? Would that help? Is that possible? I mean, if Serbia gave us some sort of green light and gave sort of de facto recognition, yes, 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 is possible. But I, you know, I'm just not really convinced that uh, you know we're we're anywhere uh, near that. And you know, as it comes to leverage, you know, yes, it has leverage up up to a point. But the fact is, you know, if at the end of the day the leaders of the parties themselves don't want to do the deal, then there's not going to be a deal. I mean, it's as simple as that. 
I mean, does the EU have leverage in Cyprus? Well, yes, it does. But, you know, there's been an, an unresolved conflict in Cyprus for many more decades than there's been in, in Kosovo. You know, do the Americans and, the, and, and others have, have influence between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, yes, they do. But, you know, at the end of the day, the two sides have, haven't been able to sort of make an agreement. So, you know, I think it's people assume that if there's a conflict, therefore there must be a resolution. But it's, that's not the case. You know, as I said, we've just, I've just given two examples where you can have conflict which goes on for a lifetime, goes on forever almost. And I hope that's not the case for the Balkans, but we'll see. You're right. The, you, we don't see any much sign of political will there. And beyond the Serbia and Kosovo standoff, what do you think is the biggest challenge, uh, in your view, uh, for the Western Balkans currently? Well, you know, obviously I could talk uh, 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 I could talk all about Bosnia and problems in Bosnia, but, you know, I don't want to do that. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing... Even Montenegro lately is becoming a big problem. Even Montenegro, but I mean, actually, I, I, fine, those are political issues that you know quite well covered elsewhere. But I think that one of the things that I've been doing over the last three or four years has been looking at the uh, demography of uh, Western Balkan states, uh, um, among other things. And, and actually, you know, in the long run, you know, it's not much good if you solve the problem between Kosovo and Serbia or in Bosnia. If, you know, there's nobody left. You know, the fact is that all of the countries of the Western Balkans, um, Kosovo is slightly less than anybody else, but everybody else is basically kind of aging. Uh, the countries are aging, people are emigrating, and they are uh, shrinking, you know, and ultimately that's very unhealthy for, for, all, of these, um, for, for, for all of these countries. And, and you know, it's, it's not just people used to talk about a brain drain, but perhaps we should also talk about a, a, a brawn drain, brawn meaning kind of, you know, physical strength, because it's basically everybody. I mean, people, especially young people, but leaving. Um, and the fact is that also Balkan countries, many of them not, not have, you know, extremely low rates of uh, low, low fertility rates. You know, Bosnia, for example, has a fertility rate of I don't know, 1.26. You need 2.1 to reproduce yourself, a country for population to reproduce itself. You know, Bosnia is amongst the lowest fertility rates on, on the planet. And, you know, all of the Balkan countries are, are, are pretty low. And, and the fact is that, you know, Apart from the fact that you don't, there are not enough children and enough babies, that people are leaving. So inevitably, countries are shrinking um, and um, and getting older, and that has that lays in a lot of problems for the future. And I think these are some of the biggest problems that that need to be looked at. Can the local governments take any action to stop the demographic crisis? I mean. It, it's very difficult for kind of small, weak and poor Balkan com countries to do things which, you know, a lot of countries that are a lot richer, you know, basically this problem, these problems are, you know, are very relatively similar in other parts of, of Europe. But I mean, you can, you know, kind of, you can mitigate them for sure. And one of the things would be obviously making countries that people want to stay in and people want to have uh, children in. I mean, you know, clearly... Um, but you can perhaps slow these developments. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't think it's possible to solve them completely, but it's possible to sort of slow them and, 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 and yeah, to, to, to mitigate them. But, you know, a lot of the, is, a lot of the ways that people try to do that, some countries have tried to do that. For example, Hungary, which has poured, I don't know, five or 6% annually of its GDP into uh, encouraging uh, women and families to have children. It turns out to be phenomenally expensive. And at the end of the day, it doesn't work. You know, if people don't want to have children and they don't want to have, you know, large families, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not going to work. But, you know, you can certainly, you know, make countries, you know, better, better off countries. Uh, you can make countries which are, sorry, uh, you know, better run, less corrupt and places that people want to live in. I mean, let, let me just give you an, uh, an example of how corruption can affect things. I, I met, I have a friend who a few years ago, who, who was very committed to her country in, I don't need to, to, to mention which country it was in the Balkans. She was very committed to living in her country and working to better her country. And one day she turned up living in Vienna with her, her family. And I go, why did you move? And she said that she had bought an apartment and um, a new built apartment, which, you know, off plan. So it was the, the block was being built. 
And uh, one day the lady on the floor underneath, who's, which floor had been completed, said, oh, have you moved in? And she says, no, what are you talking about? She said, well, somebody's moved into your apartment. So it appears that the developer had sold the apartment twice and she had a mortgage or she has a mortgage for this apartment. But the fact is that, you know, the country is corrupt enough and, and, and the judiciary is corrupt enough. There's not much she can do about it. You know, because she knows that if she tra- where it, well, she will go to court, it will cost a lot of money. It will take years and it'll take years and years and years. Uh, the developer can probably bribe the judge. And she just said, you know, I'm just fed up with this. I'm, I'm leaving. So this is a, just a sort of one kind of anecdote about, you know, how even, you know, something, uh, you know, how, how corruption can, you know, actually affect people personally so much that they actually want to leave their own country so that's just just as just sort of one one anecdote i mean the, the fact is also that that you know people want to leave because they get paid more i mean obviously that that's the, 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 that's the sort of main reason that people want to leave i mean but not not only that the story about the apartment being sold twice sounds so familiar for me so <laughs> I, but I, it doesn't it's matter it's you didn't you in. didn't say the state but i can imagine yeah but it's the countries and even the, the country similar. Yeah, yeah the country yeah. an example yeah. why you know a highly qualified person who was really committed to making their country a better place decided to to leave and take their family take their family with, with them but i mean it's just just one little and and it, sure sure but okay <laughs> Tim, uh, but uh, th- talking about rule of law and uh, fi- trying to fight corruption, do you think sanctions that the US and the UK are lately uh, introducing in the region are a good tool for improving the rule of law? Can meaningful change happen on the ground? Well, I mean, which sanctions are you referring to? What, I mean, we're talking. Well, there about- are some that are designating politicians. Uh, they are trying to, uh, especially for corruption. Exactly. Uh, both the US and the UK lately has joined the same corruption, route. but they're generally linked to political, political yes. politics. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, well, well, why not? I mean, these are sort of deeply unpleasant people. Why should we want them in our countries? So. You know, and, and and so yeah, of course, I think that. But whether it can, whether it can kind of make a long term difference, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, again, it comes down to you know political will, isn't it? There's got to be a political will in countries to to do something about it. And is there any recipe to find political will? How? Um, I don't know. I'm just a journalist. You know, I'm not a political scientist, so I'm not the right person to ask how to create some um, political will. I mean, I think part of it is. Part of it is kind of by luck. You know, there are one or two politicians that I can think of who I'm not going to name here, who I think, you know, really there's a lot of hope and, you know, could do could do a, a, a lot of good. But, you know, it's an interesting question because it's also an interesting question because it makes me think, I mean, there's a joke that people were telling, joke, it was a, an anecdote that people that was going around in Pristina when I was there last month, which was that, I don't know if this is true. So I'm telling this as like, as a joke, I'm not saying this is true, but that allegedly that the, um, or at least I'm not going to say who it was. One of the ambassadors was complaining about Alvin Kurti saying that it was very difficult because this relates to your question about leverage. It was very difficult to sort of put leverage on Alvin Kurti because he wasn't corrupt. So, you know, there's a sort of two, <laughs> two sides to that, to, to that question here. Well, uh, Tim, this has been uh, great. Thank you for talking to Balkans Debrief. Uh, and uh, I really uh, uh, read your pieces and I'm um, a big fan for your, or your, the work that you do uh, with the region too. And uh, I appreciate the time that you took to talk to us today. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sorry to be sort of quite gloomy, but, you know, I think, you know, there have been times that, you know, I've written articles about places and I thought, you know what, I didn't need to go. I could have taken an article that I wrote 10 years ago, maybe changed a few details and just used the same, same article. And, you know, unfortunately, I think probably that will be the case in, in 10 years' time. Unfortunately, so we, we can come back and do a Balkans debrief in 10 years' time and see. Well, see yeah, Tim, what, what you say is gloomy, I think is realistic. So it's, it's, we let's help the wrong. region by being realistic. Yeah, well, let's hope both wrong. <laughs> thank you very much, Tim, and thank you for uh, watching us. You can follow us at uh, AC Europe on Twitter and you can be part of this conversation. Thank you for having me. <laughs>